All right, so now we are going to the scanner and this is our lovely setup at, at in Maastricht at Scanexus and I would like to show you the things that I'm usually doing when I do layer dependent fMRI as opposed to those things that um, I'm doing when I'm not doing layer dependent fMRI. So to give you the full experience here we have that the scanner noise going on. I hope you can hear it. I will talk about the, the a very standard case of just acquiring a single shot EPI, which is, I guess, kind of the workhorse of layer dependent fMRI. You can do this um, in, in 2D or think of this in a kind of segmented shot by shot partition a 3D EPI, which is basically as simple as just acquiring your case space like this by going back and forth and back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. And back and forth. As simple as that. There's not much more to it. And even though this is very simple, it gets complicated pretty quickly. And Bob Turner is, is registered for the workshop and might be in the audience. He knows that you can write books about just this little pattern, right? Even my six-year-old nephew understands this pattern. And there are quite a few parameters necessary to fully characterize these patterns of going back and forth. So here um, are just uh, a few of them in the so-called pro pro um, protocol editor task cards. In fact, there are many task cards here, right? And even sub-task cards. And this is just the tip of the iceberg, right? There are so many parameters. And the challenge here is that there are interactions between those parameters. So as soon as you change one of those parameters, it has an effect of it on the other one. And um, these interactions become multidimensional pretty quickly. So it's quite complicated. And even this is just the tip of the iceberg because there are so many hidden parameters that didn't find their way into the protocol editor that are just set in the sequence or even more parameters in the reconstruction pipelines that also mostly did not find their way into the protocol editor. So I will talk about those few, maybe five, six parameters that I'm usually changing when I do layer-dependent fMRI. The data that I'm talking about are available here. The protocols are available here. And I gave a very similar presentation maybe a year ago, which is up to one hour. Now I will only give you the highlights of, of 15 minutes. So if you want to learn more, check out this YouTube video here. So let's start by going um, through a few like steps. Um, of like after the participant, in this case, RT is on the table. So here um, we have the standard localizer and I'm mostly showing you results here from a classical Magnetom 70. And the standard localizer looks somewhat like that. It's perfect, it's fast uh, for conventional fMRI. We know the edges of the brain so we can place our, our slices. However, for layer dependent fMRI, this is not really good enough, right? We, in layer dependent fMRI, we have small slabs, right? In order to get the TR down. So for layer dependent fMRI, we need more structure, right? And then for that, there are these kind of inversion, recovery, turbo flash uh, sequences that you can form into a localizer. If you want a protocol, you can download it from there, which gives you a nice gray matter, white matter contrast. And even though it takes a bit longer, the images are 2D, so you can just drag and drop them in during the, the one minute that it takes to acquire them. And then you would already see here kind of these structural features, for example, the calcarine sulcus, which would be of interest here for this example experiment. So we can place our thin slab very precisely um, to, to the area that, that we care about. The next thing then would be shimming. And I guess shimming is still somewhat a, a black box in the sense that um, all the knowledge and, and expertise and, and tools that are described in the academic literature did not really find their way yet into kind of the, the uh, very user-friendly applications on the vendor side. So we usually deal with a kind of binary shim, meaning that a voxel is either inside the shim box or outside the shim box. There's no kind of waiting or, or um, like ROI hotspot where you really, really want to optimize it. So usually the, the I guess, the three rules about um, shimming that I usually follow when I'm doing layer dependent fMRI is that I make the shim box a bit bigger than my thin slab. And this is partly due to the fact that the field maps that are used um, f in order to calculate the shim currents are usually not that high resolution. So you cannot easily fit a higher order spherical harmonic to just like two, three voxels of the field map that just cover this, this very thin slab. So I make it, make it slightly bigger. Additionally, also, I usually don't restrict it to the part of the sl um, slice that I care about, namely here, the calcarine sulcus, but in fact, I make it 
um, so big that it covers the entire field of view. Even though we need to make some compromises here then by optimizing the ship, uh, shimming for the entire field of view. And uh, note that the Nyquist Ghost correction is done in k-space, in the center of k-space. So it literally it takes the average of the entire slice. So um, even though um, we want to optimize this part only, if the shim would be very bad up there, the Nyquist Ghost correction, which corrects partly for uh, spatially specific eddy currents would be very bad up there and therefore we would have fold over that and uh, again um, compromise our signal in our area of interest. Then after I did the shimming I usually change quite a few parameter on the reconstruction side. Namely um, on Siemens when you press the control escape key you have this Windows XP uh, window and then you can select run and execute the program XBuilder. And th this gives you um, this little editor where you can select any files. For example, here the one in matcom config ice config evp. And this looks slightly different on the new Terra platform or VE scanners. Namely, there you would again use the control escape um, shortcut key and then um, select the command prompt and just type in XBuilder, which gives you then the same kind of editor. And within this editor, there are um, a lot of fields, specifically within um, here ice config iPad, there is this parameter called improved cropper, which even though it's improved and I think it's improving it, um, it it's named improved and still it's uh, switched off by default. So the first thing I do is, is switch that on. Note that all the parameters here within the iPad are only used when you use iPad. Um, for example, when you use a different acceleration method, for example, if you use uh, something that is often um, shown as Kuiperinia, then these parameters are not used. And the parameters to optimize the reconstruction in Kuiperinia are instead um, s written in the file here, matcom config ice pad configurator. And maybe I should I say a few words about the terminology here. Um, this might be a bit confusing. So um, pad means parallel acquisition. Um, kind of undersampling your, your your images and then trying to recover the missing case space lines based on a reference data set. And um, you can select Krapa and Kuiperinia on most of the sequences in the Siemens environment. And Krapa just refers to the simple 2D reconstruction, right? Kuiperinia does not mean in this case that you need to do a Kuiperinia field of view shifting. It's just a, a, a different algorithm, a, a different kind of reconstruction pipeline. You can do um, Kuiperinia with the same um, like in-plane acceleration as you do with uh, Grappa. However, then you're not using the iPad, but then you're using something that's called IcePad. And in Kuiperinia, you have additional functionalities. For example, there you can also do the Kuiperinia field of view shifting or even do it in a, in a 3D kind of fashion. So um, switching on improved Grappa um, does not has a huge effect on its own. And here you can see with and without improved cropper, the shading is a bit different. The TSNR, however, is rather comparable. The reason why I still switch it on is that because as soon as I switch it on, there are all these other parameters which suddenly now become used before they were just ignored. And one of the most effective parameters is this parameter here called uh, part noise um, the Grappa noise reduction one parameter, which is again a weird terminology for basically just uh, and, um, a regularization strength. So here, um, this basically determines how um, similar neighboring case base points can be in, in the Krapa kernel fit. So to um, reconstruct missing case base points based on, on a kernel that has been um, acquired in, in, and, and fitted in, in reference data. This has a huge effect and I usually change it from one to something like 3000 or 5000. And there you can see that the TSNR is hugely improved. So the default of uh, regularization of one here um, is barely exceeding the double digit regime of TSNR values, but going to 3000, it's, it's like improved by, by a factor of, of like two, three, depending on the protocol calls that you have and, and so on. Obviously you can also over regularize it by increasing it by a factor of 100,000 and then you're basically copying case space lines, make them very dependent and then you're not doing cropper after all and then you have huge ghosts. 
Usually, however, I think that the default is way too conservative. We can be much more liberal and end up with, with much better TSNR values. You can basically choose the, the TSNR that you want to have. And I find it kind of funny how in the history of, of maybe MRI or fMRI, there was so much focus on on sequences, right? It, it's There's no question that when you do kind of knee imaging at 1.5 Tesla with a kind of single channel or, or, or four, um, maybe four channel coil or whatever, you use a different sequence as if you do very high resolution functional um, fMRI across layers in the kind of in the cortex with very small RF channels, right? However, on the reconstruction side, we're still using the same crapper, right? Why should we optimize the sequence and not the, the reconstruction, right? So I think there's a lot of leeway and, and way for improvement for layer dependent fMRI by changing the reconstruction, such as here the, the regularization strength. Another parameter that I almost always change is here the number of iterations in the POX reconstruction that is used as soon as you use partial Fourier imaging. So POX stands for protection onto convex sets and uh, it's an iterative approach. So and the default is two iterations, which often works to, to converge with two iterations already. However, eight iterations um, can help you quite a bit to, to, to be sure that you converge there and then find a good solution. And it only increases the reconstruction time by, by maybe a few milliseconds or so. So there's almost no, no reason not to use it. Um, though, however, it cannot fully recover all the, the resolution loss that you always end up having when using partial Fourier imaging. And if you want to have um, more background and information, this is uh, summarized on this blog post over here. In fact, let's look at the blog post. So here, um, this is a blog post uh, just showing examples and describing the limits of partial Fourier imaging sometimes in, in layer dependent fMRI. And, and here you can see how I'm switching back and forth between a partial Fourier imaging a 5 8 so rather a liberal versus no partial Fourier, also without any crappa acceleration. So this is an extreme case with a large matrix size that takes quite a long time. And you can directly see how uh, partial Fourier imaging really improves the, the, the SNR. However, it's quite blurry, right? So um, I urge you, or I challenge you for your next experiments that you're doing, just switch off partial Fourier and see what it does with your data to get a feeling kind of how big the, 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 the blurring actually is. And I, I think a wise man once said that um, partial Fourier imaging is somewhat like taking heroin, right? It's, you know, it's bad for you, but then you sit there and you think you need it and you, you promise yourself, yeah, just the one. And I think very often it just comes down to the question, do we want to have a blurry signal with partial Fourier or do we want to have a super noisy signal basically having no signal, but then having a, a sharp no signal, right? So usually I use partial Fourier, but you need to know uh, what it does with your data. And there are a few algorithms implemented in, lay, um, in Siemens, um, for example, zero filling, the default for gradient echo bold, um, which is, I think, kind of the worst way of, of uh, with respect to the blurring, but the best way with respect to TSNR. Magrosian algorithms really nicely recover most of the local information. However, it's hugely sensitive to these epizero homogeneities, like these dark spots, which I think we will um, encounter a lot during the artifact session later. Pox is kind of a compromise between Magrosian and zero filling. Um, which is less sensitive, still sensitive though, with dark spots all, all around. And uh, here switching back and forth between zero filling and pox with eight iteration, you can see that you don't recover a lot, but you recover a bit. Uh, for example, here, the, the layer four in the uh, sensory cortex. All right, the last thing that I want to talk about is, um, I think pretty important, it caught on. And uh, mostly, I think most lay dependent fMRI um, users are are aware of it, and only very like few times I'm still seeing data that, that did not really take advantage of advanced CRAPA reference acquisition schemes. And namely, in order to reconstruct missing case based lines by means of CRAPA, we need reference data that have all the case based lines in there. And this can be done um, easily by single shot acquisition. However, in layer dependent fMRI, this takes quite a long time. So this is not an option very often. So the default is then to go to segmented approaches. 
which might be the worst way of doing it because of B0 inhomogeneities, as explained in these um, papers down there. Fleet can account for this quite well. However, in my hands, I still think that a flash reference acquisition scheme um, is uh, very often the most stable one in, in my case for 3D EPI. And since these kind of advanced acquisition schemes are not um, too established just yet, um, most sequences have their own kind of terminology about it. Sometimes it's called GRE, sometimes it's called flash. Um, check out the reference scan mode and never ever use the segmented approach if you don't absolutely have to. And the reason why is, is shown here on those data. So here I'm flipping back and forth between flash, fleet, and segmented. Flash, fleet, and segmented. And here are TSNR and mean images of a single slice where you can see that the segmented approach is very often ghosty and has very low TSNR values. A fleet recovers most of the TSNR. Sometimes it's ghosty and the, these ghosts are quite stable. Um, in flash, I find that it um, is pretty stable um, and has similar TSNR values, if not a bit higher to compared to fleet. And you don't need to worry so much about the kind of um, possible like steady state uh, problems in, in the fleet acquisition scheme. And with this, I would like to thank uh, many colleagues that showed me all these tricks. And I thank you for your attention.